I wanted to have my display going up here, but I just can't get the computer to, to do what I want it to do. So we're back to the good old days, all right? So I want you to have your Bibles open to Isaiah chapter 1 and Proverbs 30. Isaiah 1 and Proverbs 30. And we'll we'll read just uh, from from those two. Uh, again, uh, I would just have those two side by side up on the screen, but uh, it must not be God's will for me to have <laughs> that tonight. So uh, I guess I'll stop whining like a like a baby. So look with me uh, at I uh, will look at Isaiah chapter one and verse two first of all. Excuse me, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2. And the Bible says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. Then flip back to Proverbs 30 and look at verse 5. Proverbs 30 and verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. The prophet Isaiah clearly stated two essential truths for life. One is that the Lord has spoken, and the other is that we must hear. We must listen to what he has said. And that is why the church must look to Scripture alone as its authoritative voice from God. I am. I just started last week, continuing this week now, and just getting into the meat of it, really, uh, this new series and I called it How Firm a Foundation, like the, like the hymn, you know. The, the hymn says that this firm foundation is laid for your faith in his excellent word. And so we're studying the Bible, not just, not just opening the Bible and, and, and studying a portion of it, but we're studying the, the Bible itself. And I want you, as a goal for this study, I want you to have absolute confidence in the word of God. I want you to be able to understand it, to love it, and to be shaped by its words. And I want you to have supreme confidence that what you hold in your hands is the Word of God and that it has authority over your life um, to direct your life, to give you comfort, to uh, give you wisdom from God. And so that is, the, that is one of the major goals of this study. It's the technical term, the, the highfalutin term for this is bibliology, right? the study of the Bible. And hopefully when we're done, you'll be bibliophiles, lovers of the Bible. I think you probably are already, but maybe more so. And so uh, in, in, in other words, uh, but we'll, we'll uh, just call this message, uh, we just put it at this way, I would have a nice slide. It was a pretty slide too. Uh, but uh, it would say, the Bible is our final authority. That's what we're talking about tonight. And uh, I want to ask a couple of questions. One, why is that tr so? And the other is, what does this mean? Uh, and so let's put that down to a principle. The principle is this. When the Bible speaks, God speaks, and we're bound to listen. When the Bible speaks, God speaks, and we are bound to listen. And this is what we mean ultimately when we say that the Bible is our final authority. Christ is the head of the church, according to Colossians 1.18. And so let me ask you this question. How does the head direct the body? How does the head communicate with the body? Well, God has revealed himself to us in Scripture, and so Scripture is that connection between Christ the head and the church the body scripture is the authority over the church and uh, so this statement requires a little explanation and I want to explain it with two key words the key words are inspiration and authority and I want to take those one at a time so let's take the first one um, inspiration what does that mean well the Bible consistently claims to be nothing less than the perfect word of God in first in second peter chapter 1 verses 20 and 21 the bible says knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man but holy men of god spake as they were moved by the holy ghost so peter defines scripture's inspiration as being directly from god 
And, and so he says it's not from man, in verse 20, not by any private interpretation. Nobody made this up. It is actually directly from God. The agency of this work is twofold. There are human authors and the Holy Spirit who moves them. The Holy Spirit moved human authors to write the word of God. And so by the Holy Spirit's work, the human authors wrote what the Holy Spirit divinely inspired so that when the scripture speaks, God speaks. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And the word trans, translated inspiration of God literally means God breathed, as in God breathed it out. And notice that it says all scripture, every part of the scripture is divinely authored. Even, I don't know where you guys are at in your Bible readings for the year, but you start out in Genesis and you get bogged down somewhere in Chronicles, right? When you're reading all these weird names of people who begat people who begat people that you never cared about, right? <laughs> Even those parts are inspired by God. They might not be as fun to read as maybe the story of Jonah or something like that, but they're, they're all there for a reason. And so, uh, and they're all there by God's inspiration. Notice how the Bible claims, claims itself to be, in fact, the word of God. In Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, the Bible says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. And why is that important? Well, it's because here the writer of Hebrews is citing Psalm 95. He's quoting from the Psalms. And as he quotes from the Psalms, he doesn't say, hey, it says in Psalm 95, he says, hey, the Holy Ghost said this. The Holy Spirit said this. And then he quotes the Psalms. All right? And so he calls the words of the Psalm the words of the Holy Spirit. Paul does the same thing in Romans 9.15. There he refers to Genesis 33.9. And, and in quoting and, and referencing that verse, he calls it the voice of God to Moses. In Romans 9 and verse 14, it says, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he said to Moses, he said, in other words, God says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And there, Exodus 33, 9 is said by Paul to be the word of God. Now, there are many more um, examples and illustrations of that throughout the New Testament that we could show you throughout the Bible that we could show you, uh, but that would get tedious, and I don't have slides. So, uh, if we, but, but we'll, we'll move on. So, if we will have the same understanding of, of the scriptures that the apostles had, then we must believe that when the Bible speaks, God speaks. So, but must we listen? That brings a second key word, and inspiration demands this word, and that's the word authority. If the Bible is inspired, it must be authoritative. It must be the rule for our lives. Um, I had these quotes on slides, so you'll forgive me if, if, if they don't make as much impact just quoting them, but... John MacArthur, talking about authority, said, In a world of relative thinking that has no absolutes, the Bible stands as the absolute authority for the Christian. Let that sink in for a while. Isn't that relevant for today? In uh, 1978, a group of evangelical um, leaders got together, and they created what's called the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. If you want to read that, you can just Google it. Um, Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy inerrancy and and you can just find it and read it on the internet um, and uh, in that it's a great statement uh, in that statement <clears throat> they said this what scripture says God says its authority is his authority for he is the ultimate author holy scripture must be acknowledged as the word of God by virtue of its divine origin the writers of the New Testament I'm sorry, the writers of the Old Testament make more than 2,000 direct claims to be writing and speaking the very words of God. Look what Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 1, 2. Hear, O he heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. Then what is he about to do? He's about to write the book of Isaiah, right? What's he saying? He's saying this book, you should listen to it because God is speaking when, he, when you read it. 
<clears throat> so when God speaks, we must listen because he is our final authority. Jesus himself taught the authority of scripture and, and he spoke about it in such a way that we understand him to mean that all of scripture, every even little part of it carries the weight of God's authority. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter five in verses 17 and 18. He says, think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now, a jot and a tittle would be Greek, or not Greek, uh, Hebrew, parts of Hebrew letters, kind of like when we cross our T's and dot our I's, all right? That's the minutia of, of uh, writing. <clears throat> and Jesus says, until, he says, it's not going to pass away, not even the cross T's and the dot I's, till all is fulfilled. You cannot be a follower of Jesus and reject what he taught about the scriptures. There's lots of people who try to claim to be Christians and they reject the Bible as the word of God. And what they are is fake Christians who are lying to you. They are not Christians. You cannot be a follower of Jesus and, and say the opposite of what he says about very important things like what the Bible is. And so... And, and uh, despite what our culture teaches, you can't just be whatever you say you are. You can't just be a Christian because you say you are. You must actually follow Jesus. You must actually be born again. So when the Bible speaks, God speaks, and we're bound to listen. And this is true because of the inspiration of Scripture, which demands that we also acknowledge the authority of Scripture. Now, <coughs> excuse me, now this principle needs to be applied to our life. And I want to explore uh, two implications of this principle. One is a doctrine to believe, and the other is an action to take. So when we consider this principle, we should be pushed towards believing a doctrine and taking an action. So let's start with that first, that first implication, the doctrine to believe. Here, here it is, the inspiration of authority I'm sorry, the inspiration and authority of Scripture require inerrancy. The doctrine to believe is inerrancy. In, inerrancy is closely tied to, and, uh, to infallibility of Scripture. And uh, the, the short definition would just mean that there's no errors. All right? Inerrancy, inerrant, no errors, right? Um, in the Chicago Statement, in on, on biblical inerrancy, they defined both infallibility and inerrancy together. And I want to I want to read those to you. It says, "Infallible signifies the quality of neither misleading nor being misled, and so safeguards in categorical terms the truth that the Holy Scripture is sure, safe, and reliable, and a guide in all matters." Similarly. Inerrant signifies the quality of being free from all falsehood or mistake, and so safeguards the truth that the Holy Scripture is entirely true and trustworthy in all its assertions. And so, is inerrancy important? Yes. All right. Why? Why is it important? Let me give you two reasons why inerrancy is not just important, but essential to the Christian life and to reality. All right. And the first reason is theology. Now, theology is what we believe and teach about God. And Jesus and Paul and other biblical writers regarded even the details of Scripture as authoritative. They demonstrated that they believed the Bible was completely inspired by God. And if it is, if the Bible is inspired by God, then certain implications follow. Uh, first of all, if God is omniscient, he knows all things, he cannot be ignorant of error in any matter. God cannot be mistaken about something, all right? Um, for instance, God could not be wrong about the shape of the earth or the working of our solar system or the age of the universe. So if God is omniscient, he's not ignorant of those things. Further, if God is omnipotent, that is, he is all-powerful, then he is able to affect the biblical author's writing um, so that 
nothing erroneous enters into the final product. Right? He is all powerful. He can make this happen. Then being a truthful being, God will certainly desire to utilize his abilities in such a way that humans will not be misled by his word, by scripture. So if then the Bible is not fully truthful or, or our view of inspiration um, is not right, it's in jeopardy. And indeed, then we have very little confidence that the vision of God given to us in the Bible is indeed accurate. In other words, we cannot confidently say that we know God without the inerrancy of Scripture. Otherwise, all we have is the writings of old men. Am I right? The old writings of old men is all we got. And maybe we could say they were the best men who ever lived. They're still just men. So inerrancy is important because of theology. Let me give you a second reason, and that is epistemology. And uh, I just wanted to work this into a sermon at some point. I just love that word, epistemology, all right? It's fun to say. So what is epistemology? Well, epistemology is the theory of knowledge. Epistemology asks this question, how do you know? How do you know what you know? That's epistemology, all right? It's just a fun way to say, how do you know what you know? All right? Let me give you a biblical example of epistemology, and that's found in Mark chapter 2, verses 5 through 12. In Mark chapter 2, verses 5 through 12, <coughs> excuse me, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said to them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it, is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Four men, you're probably familiar with this, story from Sunday school, I'm sure. Four men had a paralyzed friend. They took him to Jesus. The crowd was so thick there at the house, they couldn't get in, so they climb up on the roof, tear through the roof. I'm sure the home homeowner was happy about that. And then they lowered this guy uh, on his cot down right to the feet of Jesus. And Jesus immediately looks at that guy, Bible says, saw their faith and said, your sins are forgiven you. Now the religious leaders brought up an important point at that at that juncture. They say, how can this guy say that? Only God can forgive sins. And the underlying idea is that just anybody can say your sins are forgiven. I could say that to you. I could walk up to anybody in a crowd and say, hey buddy, your sins are forgiven. And they're gonna look at me like I'm nuts. If someone did that to me, I would look at them like they're nuts. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and why is that? Well, it's because there's no way to prove it. Epistemology. How do you know that my sins are forgiven? How can I know that what you're saying is true? And that's what was on the mind of the scribes at that time. So Jesus asked a question. Is it easier to say to a paralyzed man, rise and walk, than it is to say, forgive, your sins are forgiven? Now, for every other person than Jesus, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. Because all you're doing is saying it, and uh, the idea is nobody can just say that, you rise and walk. Why can't, why is it that nobody can just walk up to a paralyzed guy and say, rise and walk? Well, because if the guy doesn't rise and walk, obviously you're a fraud. And so he's answering this question, how do we know? So Jesus tells them why he heals the par paralyt paralytic man in verse 10. And this is where we get into epistemology. He demonstrates his power in the thing that they can test 
so that they can know that he has power in the thing that they cannot test. If he says, rise and walk to a paralyzed man, there's an immediate test coming. We're all watching the, the scientific experiment. The data is fresh. The guy stands up and he walks. Obviously, by empirical science, we know that Jesus is not a fraud. Because when he says to somebody, your sins are forgiven, even though it really happened, no one can prove that. Now, some people say that the Bible can be false in matters of science and history where you have measurable and testable data. And they say that the Bible is right about spiritual things, but it's limited or even wrong uh, about scientific and historical things. Um, a lot of that is driven by the fear of man. People want to be Christians, but they don't want to get laughed at in science class. They don't want to get... They, 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 want, they don't want to get made fun of at university. They, they don't want to be looked at as un, uneducated rubes in the eyes of the world. And so they have to bow down and worship Charles Darwin, the most racist man who ever walked the face of the earth. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? They ever tear down his statue. Um, but anyway, if we conclude that the Bible is not true in science and history, measurable things then the implications are too much to bear. If it is false in some instances where it talks about things we can observe, then how can we trust the Bible in things that we cannot observe? If the Bible is wrong about a global flood, how can I trust it to be wrong, right about the existence of heaven? One thing that, that helps us as believers is that every time archeologists stick a spade into the ground in the Middle East, and dig up something new, it always confirms the Bible. There were for many, many years, skeptics would make fun of Bible believers because they, they, the Bible talks about the Hittites and no, no such tribe existed, there's no Hittites. And then, I don't know, about 70 years ago or something, somebody found the Hittites. Somebody found one of their cities or some of their artifacts. And uh, scoffers, they didn't print apologies, I know that, they never do that. Um, Every time uh, the, they find something new in the Middle East in their, in their, or something old in their excavations, it confirms the Bible. Inerrancy is vital because of theology and epistemology. What we know about God and how we know it is at stake when, it, when we talk about the Bible. Now, there are three witnesses that argue for biblical inerrancy. And those witnesses are uh, the Bible's testimony, the church's tradition, and the Bible's effectiveness. And so let's consider briefly the first witness, and that is the Bible's testimony. And that argues for inerrancy. We noted earlier uh, that the Bible itself claims to be the very word of God. We looked at Romans 9 and Hebrews 3. The Bible also teaches that God cannot lie. He's a truthful being. Titus 1, 2 says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Hebrews 6, 18 states similar um, facts. <clears throat> Excuse me. If God cannot lie, and he is all-knowing and all-powerful, and the Bible is the word of God as it says, then it must be without error. Consider the second witness, and that is church tradition that argues for inerrancy. Now, I need to be precise in my definition here. I do not mean, by church tradition, I do not mean the Roman Catholic sense of the magisterium, their, their church authority tradition. I'm not talking about that. Uh, I am speaking in the sense of the history of the church. I mean that the Christian church for 2,000 years has held to the doctrine of inerrancy. Um, and, and these teachings that the Bible is full of errors, they're Johnny come lately. They, they, they weren't around uh, at, the, at the beginning of the church, throughout the time of the apostles and the church fathers, and, uh, and even, even the medieval church and the Reformation, they all held to the inerrancy of Scripture. Uh, Albert Moeller, in the book Five Views on Biblical Inerrancy, writes this. He said, Earlier generations in the church argued about the proper interpretation of the Bible, the relative authority of the Bible, and such issues as the translation of Scripture, but not about the question of the Bible containing errors. Augustine, the 
um, fourth century Christian church father writes, and if in these things I am perplexed, he's talking about reading the Bible, and if in these things I am perplexed by anything which appears to me opposed to the truth, I do not hesitate to suppose that either the manuscript is faulty or the translator has not caught the meaning of what was said or I myself have failed to understand it. And what he's saying is if I'm reading the Bible and, and I can't, something just seems oppo opposite the truth, maybe, I, maybe someone, whoever made this copy, remember they didn't have uh, printing presses back then, whoever made my hand copy here might have messed it up or whoever translated might have mistranslated it. But the Bible itself, he says, does not have errors. Or I, I could just be off my rocker. Maybe I am the one that's misunderstanding. But the Bible, he says, is not full of errors. Martin Luther uh, wrote this. He said, natural reason produces error and heresy. Faith teaches and maintains the truth. For it clings to the scriptures which do not deceive or lie. So from the, from the apostles to the Reformation, to the 19th century, the church has always held without question the belief that the Bible is without error, and only recently skeptical scholars began to question this fact. Church history is a strong voice for inerrancy. Consider this third witness, and that is the Bible's effectiveness. Its function in the church argues for inerrancy. In Ephesians chapter 2, in verses 19 and 20, The Bible says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now what is the foundation of the church? Well, the foundation of the church is the apostles and prophets with Christ as the chief cornerstone. What does Paul mean when he says the apostles and prophets? Did they bury the apostles and prophets under the special... Uh, cathedral somewhere in Rome? No. No. The prophets designate the Old Testament revelation. That They are the authors of the Old Testament. The apostles, um, even though they were living at the time of Paul, they were the ones who God used to write the New Testament. And so that served as the foundation for the church, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Bible functions effectively as the church's foundational authority. Uh, Albert Moeller writes this, Put bluntly, if the Bible is not the very word of God bearing his full authority and trustworthiness, we do not know what Christianity is, nor do we know how to live as followers of Christ. I think if we were to uh, open up a, a portal into time and look back through the eons of time to a first century church in the Middle East, First of all, they would be dressed very differently. Their, their, their church building would look very different. Um, maybe some of the way, the way they sang would probably be, be really different, and a lot of the mannerisms would be different. But they would be teaching the same doctrine that we do. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a faithful church, they'd be teaching the doctrine of the apostles and prophets. And that's what connects us all the way through the, the years. That's why the church today is the same as it was back then. There's a lot of differences but essentially, the essential things that matter, we are the same. And we see that, uh, we see what's happened to so-called churches that have abandoned their belief in the inerrancy of Scripture. Many of them fly pride flags this month to affirm what the Bible condemns as an abomination. Where do they get that from? Well, they submit to the same authorities to which other cultural institutions submit. Uh, you know, this month, every logo on every major company has changed to a pride logo, right? And so it's no surprise that churches that have abandoned the scriptures follow suit. They just do what the world is doing. Um, and, and so uh, Millard Erickson puts it this way, to the extent that evangelicals abandon the position that everything taught or affirmed by scripture is true, other bases for doctrine will be sought. If, if this is not our final authority, then we will search for something else, is what he's saying. But churches that continue to hold fast to the inerrancy and authority of Scripture, though they're not perfect, far from perfect, they do not drift into such gross sin. And so when the Bible speaks, God speaks. And we're bound to listen to him. 
The world is shouting and screaming in the opposite direction. The, the voice of foolishness cries out in the streets. And the only voice of reason that we can trust is the word of God, the Bible. Now, we are exploring two implications to this principle, and one is a doctrine to believe, and, <clears throat> and that is that the authority uh, uh, and inspiration of Scripture requires inerrancy. And the other implication um, is more practical. It's an action to take. And so we could state it this way. The inspiration, authority, and inerrancy of Scripture require reverence and submission. Reverence and submission. It is true that God speaks when the Bible speaks. And if that is true, then we must listen and react accordingly. So this doctrine requires two reactions. One is reverence and the other is submission. I think we understand what reverence means. And uh, basically we don't treat the Bible just like any other book. Uh, we don't, we, we, there's, there's different ways of expressing that. I don't, I don't think there's any hard and fast rules on that. Uh, personally, I don't put anything on top of my Bible. I just, I, I'll stack other books. This one's different than the rest of the books. I was talking to Shahid last time he was here. We were having a conversation about this very subject, and they had had a, a preacher come from, I guess, a big time, I don't know, they thought he was a big, big wig preacher come from the United States to preach in Pakistan. And there the church assembled, and while he was sitting on the platform, he took his Bible and he set it on the floor down by his, down by his feet. They had flown him from America to Pakistan to preach to them, and he was not allowed to preach. You don't put the Word of God on the floor, is what they said. All right? Uh, talk about taking it seriously. That's reverence. All right? I've told this story a million times, but in Awana, I took my Bible and I said, the sword of the Lord, and I smacked one of my friends over the, over the head with it and immediately got collared by one of the Iwana workers. It was a lady. She told me what for. Uh, and I didn't appreciate it at the time, but I've never forgotten it. You don't do that with the Bible. And I didn't, I didn't get it at the time. I knew it was special, but I just thought, I just, I'm just messing around. What's the big deal? Uh, but that's what reverence is. There, it, when there's reverence, there's no messing around. It's, it's God's holy word. So I, I think we understand what reverence is. So I want to focus on submission. And, and there's a difference between assent and submission. That difference really is functionality. Assent says, yes, I know the Bible is true. Submission says, because the Bible is true, I must adapt my life to what it says and what it teaches. I must adapt my life, my thoughts, my actions, and my priorities to that of the Bible. James 1.22 says, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And so those who only hear the word and say, ah, I agree with that, and don't, don't submit to the word, what they are described as here is self-deceived. And uh, there's, there's no fool like someone who fools themselves, right? Uh, and so, I, I wish I had this on the screen. I'm going to continue whining about this. But uh, anyway, uh, but just as a matter of application, complete this statement in your mind. Recently, I have looked to Scripture as the final authority in my life in the following ways. Can you complete that? It would be easier on screen, I know. So let me repeat it. Recently, I have looked to Scripture as the final authority in my life in the following ways. Have you come face to face with Scripture and it has maybe given you an authoritative word on something comforting or something that it pointed out that you're wrong and this needs to be changed? I was talking to somebody earlier this week and and we were talking about a passage of scripture and I said sometimes the Bible just punches you in the face and and then I said and it doesn't stop uh, you, you, you'll go the rest of your life and once in a while right in the face and if it doesn't then you're not reading it close enough um, and so uh, how about this complete this statement I know the Bible is important to me because fill in the blank does it order your priorities? Um, somebody put on Facebook, and I know Facebook is the sum of all wisdom, but somebody put on Facebook, 
church is my excuse to miss everything else. <laughs> kind of taking the lame excuse of all the things people have. I got sports tonight. I got, I got this and that going on. I can't make it to church. Wonderful. In the Ukraine, they're packing the churches out. I think if we had shells exploding around our city, people wouldn't skip church for softball or whatever they're doing. Um, and I say that as a sports junkie, right? But I, the older I get, the more I hate youth sports, but uh, or men's sports anymore. But uh, anyway, uh, I I know the Bible's important to me because, and uh, again, I talked about church attendance, but uh, how many things will will bump your uh, you have 24 hours in a day, all right? Somewhere in that day, there should be a slot for I'm going to spend time reading my Bible, communing with the God of this universe. That should be on the docket there. If it's not, something's bumped it out. Sleep. Um, Facebook. Uh, the average... Should I should have put this in... Of course, I didn't think all this through earlier, but uh, the average, I forget the age group, I think 10 to 14 year old uh, is on a screen um, and it's over 10 hours a day. I can't remember the amount of time. It's over 10 hours a day. Uh, now that could be for many reasons, but um, yeah, what, what bumps the priority of that out of your life? It better be an atomic bomb, <laughs> right? Um, so the inspiration, authority, and inerrancy of Scripture requires reverence and submission. George Keith wrote, How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can we say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? When the Bible speaks, <laughs> God speaks, and we are bound to listen to him. Um, Sir Walter Scott, the famous British novelist, was a poet and, and a committed Christian. When he was on his deathbed, Scott was reported to have said to his secretary, bring me the book. And his secretary wondered, which book? There are thousands in your library. Walter Scott replied, the book, the Bible, the only book for a dying man. The Bible is indeed the only book for a dying man, but that's, it's not just that. It is the only book for the living as well, because it's the word of God. When, God, when the Bible speaks, God speaks, and we are bound to listen.